Okay, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. Um, so, uh, we'll jump straight in. One of the things I'll say to you, though, is uh, I'm from Ireland. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. And we, we talk very fast, okay? So if you guys, this is going to be a little bit interactive. So if you don't understand what I'm saying, Susanna on the back, you can start it by going, uh, okay, don't be afraid to do that, okay? Uh, there you go. Okay, I might speed up. I'll try not to. But thank you again, guys, for having me. So, who am I? Why am I here? What am I doing talking to you people? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm a producer. So, I work with Suzanne over here. Uh, and I work, we, we have the, the great pleasure and joy to work at King, somewhere where hopefully we'll see some of you guys in the, few, in the future. Um, as I said, I'm from Ireland. It's a, it's a little country. Hands up here who knows anything about Ireland? Very few hands. Oh, there's a one or two down there. Yeah, okay. What do you know about Ireland? Whiskey. whiskey. There you go. All right, if I had an award, I'd give it to the person who said whiskey. Beers? Beers? Guinness. Guinness. Guinness, there you go. Ale, very good. I'm glad it's all alcohol-based. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Well, another thing about Ireland is actually the people in Ireland are very, very similar to here. We're very warm, we're very open, very friendly. So that's why I like it here. I like living here. One of the things, though, that's a little bit different is the weather. It's, it's cold and wet all the time, all the time. So now I live here amongst other nice, warm people in a warm country. So, uh, yes, thank you for having me in the country as well. So I'll give you a little bit of a background where I come from, what I've done in my career. Uh, originally, I started as a 3D animator very, very long ago, many, many years ago. Um, so I moved to London and started as a 3D animator there. Uh, I went from animation into 3D modeling. Uh, that's where I moved into the game side of things. Before that, I was in television and film. Uh, from modeling, I became a supervisor of departments. So it was mostly asset departments and various different uh, elements within games. From there, I became a producer. Uh, I've been lucky enough to work on console, on online Facebook games, and mobile for the last six, seven years, something around that. So, as a producer, what I'm going to do today is hopefully just give you like an overview, okay? Uh, and Susanna gave me a good tip, actually. If at any point you guys want to sort of jump in, if you have a burning question that you really want to ask here, for sure, jump in. That's no problem. Uh, if not, just keep it to the end and we can, we can ask as many questions as you like. So it's going to be a bit of an overview. I'm not going to go too deep on any one specific subject, right? But what I'd hope to get at the end of this is that you have a, an understanding of the full process of creating, going through the release process, and having a live game. So it's, it's, the, it's, it's sort of a producer's view of what we have to take care of, what we have to look at, because we're kind of a jack of all trades, OK? So I'll, I'll, I'll go through some things. The, the real sort of headlines here are the life cycle. So you, you kind of need to know the life cycle of a game if you want to work on it, right? Uh, and the other, the other elements are project needs. So what do you need to make that game? What do you need in various different elements of the life cycle of a game? And of course, we can have Q&A at the end. Make sense? Yeah. Enthusiastic, all right. Questions and answers. So you can ask me questions, I'll give you answers. Unless I'm asking questions, then you give me the answer, right? Awesome, but well, that would be silly. Right? Let's try not to do that. Okay, so what do I do? What do producers do in games? Well, it kind of depends on where you work, right? I've been called a development director, a project manager, a producer. You know, there's, there's different names for different things. It depends on the company. It depends on the project. But in reality, all producers are managers to a degree, okay? So what do we manage? So we manage products, right? That's that often you'll hear us called product managers or product owners, OK? Uh, we'll get back to that later. Um, but product owners and producers are, are generally the same thing. We worked in the product family. So we are tasked with creation of the product and managing of the product, OK? Uh, to do that, you have to be a project manager. If you have a producer who doesn't know how to project manage, kind of in trouble, right? So we, we basically. We manage the project. Who do we need for the project? What do we need to deliver on the project? Who do we need to talk to in various elements of the company, or external or internal, basically? Yeah? Of course, it's the project plan as well. That's the fun stuff that we get to do. More importantly than anything, though, 
is the, is the people. So yes, we manage the people. Um, and they are, I hope you really come away with this, is that they are the most important thing. Your product is nothing without the people, okay? So we have the fun and joy to work with these amazing people. Okay, so we talk about product. So really, when it comes to a product, the, the life cycle is, it's very, you can break it down into some very basic three things, okay? So you have the ideation phase, right? So your ideation phase is where, oh, yes, I can make whatever I want, all right? The world is your oyster. And you come up with great ideas, fantastic things, and then you hit the production phase and reality slaps you in the face like a wet fish, okay? So they, they, they're the two first parts. But the ideation phase, it, it, we'll speak a bit about it later on. Um, that is really the fun part. I think I can look down there and see a head nodding. It is, it's, it's, a, it's a really great fun part. The production part is, is, as it sounds, the production. It's where you're really making the game. It's where you're trying to get this thing out the door and make some money. And then you've got live. So these are all very different, different areas and different uh, points of creating the game. And it's, it's important to know what each of them are. So let's, let's go a little bit deeper into each one. OK. So in reality, what you have is this is the general life cycle of a game. Now, obviously, at the beginning, I've said we're talking about mobile because I work in mobile. But a lot of what I'm going to say, you can kind of put it onto mobile, box title, you know, PC. It's all kind of the same thing. From a production point of view, you kind of need to know all of these things depending on the game you are. It doesn't really matter. You have to, you have to approach it the same way, right? So pitch. So the pitch, we'll, we'll go into greater detail, but the pitch is obviously the very beginning, your idea. What are you going to do? Who are you pitching it to, right? Prototyping, the fun part, right? The bit where most people get lost, right? Just creating things because it's nice and fun and this is cool. And that can go in the game and that can go in the game. That's, that's a fun area, but it's a little bit dangerous. You've got your pre-production. So your pre-production is organization. You're getting ready for the race, okay? That's where you're, you're figuring out what do we want at the end? What do we have to do? What's going on? That's a really busy area for a producer. Production. Longest period. That's the period where most people get lost. That's the period where most games get cancelled. It's, it's really long. It's like it's, it's a marathon, essentially, right? That's the one bit where we always say, now the race begun, but really it's a marathon. You have to pace yourself. Uh, play test, we'll, we'll come to that later, but it's, uh, play test, it's, a, it's a tricky area as well. It's a tricky time. A lot of, it's kind of a, a dangerous time as well. Um, and of course, you've got your live. Uh, and, one of the things that I, I want to sort of impress on you guys is all of this stuff here is very different to this one. Yeah? Uh, the idea that, you just, that, that you're going through the beginning bit, then you're in the middle bit, and then you're live and it's all the same. That's not, that's a, that's not a reality, and you need to get that out of your mindset and the way you think, okay? They're, they're, different, they're different formats, and you have to work in a different way at the different times. So. Let's go a little deeper into each one. OK, so in reality, from a time scale perspective, this is kind of what each one of those looks like, right? So your ideation phase is generally around about this in, you know, relative to the, to the rest of the timelines, sometimes even shorter. It depends. Your production period is the longest period. That, that can go, depending on what you're building, it could be six months, it could be three years, it could be five years. You don't want to be doing it for five years, believe me. Um, but that, that can be a long period of time. And as I say, that's the, kind of a dangerous period because you can kind of get lost as to what you're doing. So we'll, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit later as to, to how not to get lost, hopefully. So in terms of real life examples, this is SimCity Build It. So this is a project I worked on only at the beginning, uh, years ago, 2013. OK. Um, so this is just to give you. Uh, a real life example of what it looks like or the beginning parts of a plan. This has been electronic arts, and so this is what we looked at as a feasible production plan for this particular game. <coughs> it took a little bit longer. Shh, don't tell anyone. Um, so essentially what you've got here is, uh, this is this is quite detailed, and I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail here, but you've got internal and external gates. Now what the gates are, are essentially they're goals, right? They're things you have to achieve. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. but. 
again, these are the areas that, are, that we were talking about earlier. They're broken down. Now, this is a little bit more detailed because you have to sell it to EA, and that's not a lot of fun. There's a lot of people in a big boardroom with angry stares, and you're trying to sell them, like, this is, this is going to work. Let me, let me have the team. Uh, and so, yeah, so you've got your concept and your prototyping phases, first production, core production. It's basically production. Uh, final production, cert. Cert is something you don't really have to worry about unless you're in EA or Microsoft or something like that. They make you go through the most boring process I have ever done in my life. Fell asleep several times, so did it wrong. Um, it's just certification for the, to release the game. Approvals, again, we'll talk about that later. And then live. So that, you can see here, we're going from March 2013, and it's going all the way till April 2014. And that was considered very tight with a reasonably small team. So you can see that, that's, you kind of look at that and you go, oh, that's, oh, we've got plenty of time. Loads of time, right? When you're here, right? You're like, yeah, this is easy. We've got lots of time. And then when you're here, you're going, oh, oh no. We haven't got a lot of time. We haven't done half of the stuff we need to do. So we'll move on. Hopefully, you can get something from this. Yeah. Sorry? Good question. So we will come to that later. I'm not going to answer right now, but we'll, we'll, we'll come to it. So we'll get through each one, and you'll see what it is at the, at the very end. So your pitch process. So what, what are you doing in your pitch process? Does anybody here have any idea what you what would you do if you're going to pitch your game? Shout out a few ideas. Yeah. If you're going to pitch, right, you're in the pitch mode. What are you doing? What's your job? That's great. Pitch it to me. What do you need to do? First of all, you need to have an idea. Yeah. Sure, sure. OK. So that, I mean, that, that's a good starting point, right? So that really is. You, you, you have to have an idea, right? You have to have a clear idea. But to get that idea, there are a few things you should do first, right? And the things I'm going to mention to you here are maybe not as practical to you right now, because to do a pitch right now, really, you can pitch it to your teacher, and they'll say it's good or bad, or how are you going to do it? And it comes from an idea, and that's what you really need at the beginning. But once you leave here, you need a few more things for a pitch. And these are, these are just some advice that I would strongly advise taking. It's your market research time, right? So you're analyzing the competitors. So first of all, you're going, what's in the market? Like, let's say you have your idea, right? And you go, OK, I want this idea. First of all, you've got to go, is the market saturated with this idea? Does this idea make any sense? So you analyze the competitors. You analyze what other people are doing. Your idea might make absolute sense. Maybe somebody else is doing it, but maybe they're not doing it as well as you think you could do it. Right? So analyze what they're doing. See what's in the market. Look at the surroundings of the area you want to enter. Okay? So think about your idea, but think about where it's going to go. How does it fit? Right? The other thing you want to be doing here is, whilst you're doing that, you're identifying the market space. Okay? So you're going, okay. Is it going to fit in this area? Is it going to fit in this area? Who are the people who are going to play my game? And are there too many people already playing those games? Can I compete with this, this, the other people who are in this area? So these two first bits are quite important, right? Because what you're really doing is you're, you're giving yourself a, a kind of should we or should we not. You're not just flipping a coin. You're not just rolling a dice. You're making an educated guess on where you want to sell your product within the market. Okay? I know it sounds boring. And uh, it, it probably can be, but it's, it's not really. What you're doing, and I'm sure you guys do it here all the time, is you analyze games, you tear them down, you do various different things like that. That's what it is, basically. That's all you're doing. But at the end of that, you're going to go, ah, found a hole in the market. That's where we're going to go. Okay? So there might be multiple holes in the market, you know? It's, it's, it, but it's something you really should do first. So the reason you're doing it is because you're trying to define the business opportunities. And again, Boring, right? I know, it sounds really boring. But if you do this, especially if you're an independent developer, this is going to really help you. Because if you come to me, right? Let's say I've got pockets of cash and I'm looking to invest, right? And you go, I've got an idea. I'm going to go, and? What's your idea going to do, right? But if you come and you go, I've got an idea. I've done some market research. I know what the, the rest of the competition are doing. I know exactly where this is going to fit. This is how you're going to get your money back. Because in X, Y, Z, or months or time, we're going, to be, we're going to be raking in the cash, right? And I don't want to be too businessy. I know you guys, we're, we, make, we make games to, 
for fun, right? We enjoy it, right? It's a passion. And believe me, everyone we work with is passionate about what they do. Nobody comes to work just for a paycheck, okay? But these are things that can help you on the path of selling your idea. So you have your idea, now you can sell it. If you have these things and you sit in front of an investor, they're going to go, oh, well, okay, actually, this person has done their due diligence. Maybe they're worth investing in because investors don't just invest in your product. Sometimes they don't give a damn about your product, but they do invest in you. And if you've done these things, then you show that you're worth investing in because you know what you're doing, basically, right? And so this is, this is a good thing to do during your pitch process. It's all just things to remember, right? There's lots of other things, but these are a good base, I think. So prototyping. So, so this, again, I, I, can't, I can't stress how much this is the fun part, right? This is the bit that we all want to do. I'm looking down here again. If we could just be in prototyping all the time, believe me, we would just prototype all the time. It's great fun because you can do what you just do whatever your mind comes up with, right? Um, but in reality, again, there's some harsh truths in the, in the real world of, of creating games, in the game development world, right? So what do you want to be doing? Again, this is me from a producer's point of view, the things that I want to be doing while my team is having fun, basically, right? I'm doing documents while they're creating fun. So you're going to really want to create your core loop at this point, right? You've, you've got your idea, you know where the marketplace is, but the, you've got to really kind of understand what's the basis of the game, right? And everybody here knows what the core loop of a game is, right? It's just, it's, it is what it says in the tin, right? So you want to kind of understand what that is. That, that you kind of already should have, but the, the next... The next element you want to do is, is identify the game mechanics, and that's the fun part, right? Because that's the part where you're creating loads of different things that you think will fit into that core loop, right? So the things that you think, oh, this mechanic would be cool, this one would work with this. You really, you're going to go through quite a few of them, and that's, this is kind of the bit where, as a producer, we're wrangling, right? We're kind of, oh, hold on, there's too many things, we're not going to be able to test it, because you've only got a finite amount of time, right? But you're really identifying the mechanics. You're identifying the things that are going to be fun, that are going to work within the game, and that you're going to be able to sell, essentially, right? So it's, it's pretty straightforward. So again, businesses, sorry to get back to it, but the reality is, right, I'm talking about a freemium model here, right? Now, you can go for a premium model as well. That's, that's great. Uh, obviously, pr freemium is the one that's taken off, right? You're looking at your candy crushes. Obviously, we're talking about that because from King. But the reality is the freemium model is, is actually it's a pretty good one, right? And, and the reason being it works off of microtransactions. Microtransactions are very effective because I, I pay all the time in games. And it's, it's, it's a small amount of money. It's not like you're spending 30 bucks on a game, right? You're spending like, it could be 99 cents. It could be one euro, you know? It's not a lot of money. But if you can get, if people pay once, in your game, the likelihood is they're going to pay again, right? And that's, that's kind of like the, the philosophy of, of freemium. But one thing you have to remember as well is um, it, the reason I say it needs to be core to the gameplay is because if it's not fun and it, I don't get something good out of it, why should I spend? You know, if I, if I pay in a game and it's not, so first of all, if it's not in the core loop, right, if it's not like something that's integral to how I go forward within the game, if you take me out of that core loop and go, hey, look, there's a shop here, you want to buy some stuff? No, I don't want to buy some stuff. Why did you take me out of the core loop of the game? It doesn't make any sense. So it really make sure, if you can, that monetization is a part of that core loop. If you look at, again, I'm going to say Candy Crush because it's the most well-known. Um, you know, People pay in that because it's exactly at the right time, right? Do you want to play on? Is it, 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 do you feel like you want to play on? Yes, I do. But you should also get what I like to call the Peggle effect. Who here has played Peggle 2? Peggle 2? One person? It's, a, it's actually quite an old game, so I'm surprised even one person. Two, three, okay, great. Um, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, when do you know that you cross the line between premium and pay to win? Uh, okay, so that's really in the design. If, you've, if you're hit with paywalls, you'll know when you're, pay, when you're playing it. If you're playing the game and you're like, I can't go past this without a, basically a, either a paywall, which is not a good one, uh, pay to win, again, that, it's, it become, it's very obvious within the design. Like, you only have to play it once and you're like, boom, okay, I can just pay as much as I want to, to win the game. It becomes apparent very, very easily. You're not going to need any hidden secrets or look for any hidden things in there. That will be in the design immediately. And your designers will catch it. I guarantee you that. Right? 
<laughs> it, it's it's really straightforward that bit, I would say. Um, but yeah, so in, in the going back to the free movement, just make sure that the monetization is a is a core loop. And the reason I bring up the Pegel effect is because if you play Pegel, right, it's one of those games where every little thing is a little bit over exaggerated, right? And you're kind of like Every, every time you win, it's like, holy crap, I just, that, I mean, wow, big time, fireworks, the whole shebang, the whole thing is great, right? It's over-exaggerated, right? But the reason I say this is a pegged effect is I should feel like that when I pay, right? And in the core loop, I should feel like I got something out of that, and I'm happy because of it, and it should last, okay? If I pay, and it's like, this isn't even a part of the main part of the game, what have I bought, you know what I mean, what have I done? I'm not going to pay again. It's not going to happen, right? So just... Just try and have it as a part of the core loop and remember that. Because if you think about it afterwards, it's going to be kind of hard to, to wedge it in there. Okay? So pre-production. Uh, well, really, this is your time where you're ramping up. Okay? So this is the time where you're like, OK, we've got, we've got green lit, essentially. You've got the goal. All right? So now you need to figure out who do you need and what do you need for the team. Right? So you're ramping up the team. You, it's, it's kind of a slow process, but it's essentially assembling the team, right? Um, the production plan. So this is the time for me as a producer where it's very important to have the production plan. It's very important to, to go, okay, where are we going with this? What are we doing? You know, what's the, what's the, the plan from the beginning, middle, and end, right? One thing I would say about production plans, remember this, right? A lot of the time you hear, stick to the plan, stick to the plan. Yes, stick to the plan, the, the overall plan. But believe you me, the plan at the beginning is going to be pretty different to the plan in the middle, and it's going to look totally different to the plan at the end. Okay? But there's certain things you can do to ensure that it still stays a plan. Right? The other thing is there has to be clear team goals. Okay? Because as a producer, you need to understand that you're facilitating the team. Right? If you have a producer standing in front of you who says, I'm the boss because people do as I say, in my opinion, they don't know what they're talking about. Okay? It's not a producer's job. Producers' jobs to make sure they create an environment where the team can succeed and thrive. Okay, that's our job. Um, clear team goals is the way to do it. If you don't have clear team goals, it's very easy to fall apart. So have those ready at the beginning and agree them with your team. Your team are the they're, they're the army. They're the people who are going to create everything, right? So vision. You're going to hear me bang on about vision a little bit in this talk. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so vision is, vision is something that, uh, as a producer, you're going to have designers. Designers will, will hold the vision as well. The team, in reality, should hold the vision of the game. But as a producer, it's your job to, at the beginning, have a very clear vision of what the game is about. Okay? Now, I can tell you, literally, more stories than I have fingers on my hand about where we've lost the vision, or we just didn't create it. Earlier on, I, I, when I was making games, I didn't really think about the vision, to be honest with you. It wasn't as uh, imprinted in my mind as it is now. And I created a few teams, and I tried to work in a few games, and the ones that kind of were very wishy-washy, probably not delivered very well, or got cancelled more often than not, um, they didn't have a clear vision. And that was my fault. I didn't create a vision with the team. So the team can all go, that's what we're doing. That's the place we want to go. We understand the vision, right? Not that long ago, we had a game where we, we could ask people, right? Literally, take people aside and go, what's the vision of the game? What's the vision? What's the vision of the game? Multiple people on the game, right? Different answers. Everybody. Everybody was going their own direction. Nobody knew what the vision Well, everybody thought they knew what the vision of the game was, but nobody knew, right? Everybody had their own idea. This is super common, very common. Remember the vision. Have a clear vision. If you, sometimes I put the vision up on the wall. So people are like, that's what we're doing. Okay? So nobody has any questions. Okay, so the other thing that you want to have, obviously, with the vision, along with that, is they're agreed outcomes. Okay? So you have to have clear communication with your team. And you have to have agreed ideas with your team. Okay, let's say we're all a team, this down here, right? We're developers, you've got your artists, you've got, I don't know, some strange people at the back. And basically, if I want you guys to have a shared vision with me, and we're all going in the same direction, you have to agree with it. You have to, if you don't agree, and you think this is nuts, we should be going left, not right, then we've got a problem, right? We all have to agree. It's not my job to tell you. It's our job to figure it out together, okay? Remember that. Always figure it out together. So have a agreed outcome and very clear uh, communication. It's super important. 
Communication is the thing that we always try and fix. I've never seen it perfect, but just focus on it, right? So you're in production, okay? Now the race is on. Shit just got real, okay? So the race is on. It's, it really is that point where you're like, whoa, okay, brilliant, fantastic, right? So what do you want to think about here? So as a producer, you kind of, again, you want to champion the vision and the goals. So the stuff I've been banging on about, right? The, the reason I say that is, again, going back to production, this is a time where it's super long and you're probably going to get lost multiple times. And it's very easy to get lost. So again, think about the vision and think about the goals. If you have those, it's fine. Don't let your goal be the end of the game. All right? If your goal is the end of the game, you're going, to make, you're going to find it very difficult to get to the end of the game. Just create goals as you go along. It, it, it's much better for a team to have goals. So drive continued iteration. So this is something that uh, we talk about the different ways of working later on. But essentially, continued iteration, the most basic way I can describe it is if you come out of your prototyping phase right, and you have a playable game, you want to never leave that state, right? You never want to have a broken game. You're always iterating, right? So you're always building on top, building on top, building on top. And you have to drive that continued iteration, right? And it's actually kind of difficult because sometimes you go work on something else and that doesn't work and then the thing is broken. Always iterate on what you've already got. Build, 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 right? And that's your job as a producer. So support the team's success. This is something that I was talking to you guys about earlier is we're not here to top down and tell people what to do, do this and do that. That's not a very good producer, right? You have to support the team and make sure they can succeed the way they want to succeed. So the landscape's going to change. Like I said, this is a really long, 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 long part of the road, OK? So it's going to change. People are going to leave. Uh, the, you know, the, the company vision might change. Certainly, the way you started will not be the way you end. So you have to adapt and make sure that your team can adapt as well, all right? Even if it's tools, all right? Oops, went the wrong way. OK, so play test. Right. What's a play test? I saw lots of heads just coming up, hands there. <laughs> test the production of the game. OK, but it's not just that, right? You've already tested the game yourself. So who do you want to test? Exactly, exactly. That's exactly it. Why? Fantastic analogy. I might steal it. Exactly. It's like your child. You don't know how ugly it is until someone else tells you, right? Okay. So. Essentially, but you're very right. You need people external, right? You don't, want, you don't want internal people. Because if you're making your own game and you're playing it yourself, this is great. I'm very clever. I'm like, well, look how this jumps around. You're probably wrong, OK? The, 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 realistic, uh, the reality of the situation is when we do play tests, we're like, oh my god, we've just messed up everything. You, know, you, you really, it, it opens your eyes. And sometimes it's very difficult to watch. I have to say, sometimes like it's, it's like a slow car crash, you know, and you just can't get out of the way. It's, it's painful, you know, because people are just like, your kid is ugly, okay? So that, that's, that's definitely tough. Um, but the reason I show this diagram is because really what, what's going to happen is throughout your playtest, you're going to kind of be going back to production, right? You're, you're kind of still in production. So there's a lot of tweaking, a lot of asking questions, forward, back, forward, back, okay? So the, the one thing when you... I want you to know about this as well. Your playtest is really your approvals, right? Because if you're making a game for a group of people and they don't like it, then it's not approved, OK? Just because you like your game, nobody cares, right? Honestly, it, nobody cares what you think of your game, right? The people that are playing your game are the most important people to tell you about your game. And I would implore you, please, if you're doing a project now, if you're testing a game, don't just show your friends, don't just show your family, because they won't tell you how ugly your kid is, OK? They're related, right? Really? So what I would do is, if you can, get a group of people. It's super easy now. We've got Facebook, you know, we've got friends with other friends. Get other people to play your game and, and really listen to them and watch how they're playing, right? Don't just listen to what they're saying. Watch what they're doing. If you can, record them, 
Yeah, it's really, really good way to do it. So that's your approval process. And actually, the, pro the, the one I showed you about EA, we actually call it approvals. If it didn't pass play test, it would cancel. Yeah. Uh, when, the play tips, when the play testing begins, yeah. do you only target uh, testers within the audience you, you want to sell that game, or do you look for other kind of players? Uh, very good question. So ideally the first, right? Because ideally if you're selling to a group of people, you want to know how they feel about the game, right? So ideally you want to try and do that. However, it is also very, very advisable to get a lot of other people who aren't really your, your demographic, right? Because you might have, your demographic might be sort of, I don't know, housewives, right? Okay, that is a general demographic, right? But you might want hardcore players, right? Uh, males, females between the age of 14 to 35 to play it, right? That, that's something because they might give you little tidbits that you, you might not get from the other group, right? So all are great, to be honest with you. Everyone who you can put your game in front of who doesn't know you and doesn't know your game is good, right? But yeah, ideally, if you can get a good group of cohorts that are from your, your target audience, that's the strongest because it, it's probably the best kind of knowledge you'll get, right? But good question. So what do you do? So this is a really important bit. Again, I know these are really boring words that I'm using, and I, it, it is sort of from a business point of view, right? But actually, at this point, you do need to be testing the data, right? You need to analyze the data, OK? So retention, anybody? Essentially, yeah. So your retention is how you're retaining the players, right? How if people are coming back to your game, that's your that's your main thing. Arguably, depending on who you ask, the most important, right? Because you could have a really cool looking game. You could have like the best monetization hooked into a core loop that's just fantastic. But if people aren't coming back, you've got nothing, right? So retention is really important. So it's good to test that and see. A lot of the time here, you're testing your own sort of thoughts, right? I think this, I think that, right? So tension. Progression. Everyone knows what progression is. Why do we test progression? Exactly. So you want to see if you've got the difficulty curves right. Uh, people progressing through the game in the pace that you expect them to. That's really going to change your design, right? And, and that's actually kind of difficult. You, you kind of, we can do all the kind of hypothetical diagrams and get all the data and put it together. But really, until we get people playing it, we don't know, right? So you want to ensure you test the progression because that'll, that'll explain to you when you want to be putting new elements into your game, right? So bookings. So you'll hear me talk about gross bookings. That's just what we call income, right, basically. That's just what we call money, right? At different companies, it's different things. So if you hear me say gross bookings, it's just how much money we might make within the game. That's all it is, OK? So you want to be testing that as well. But again, without the first two, you're not going to make any money, right? OK, so this is another thing that I really want you to take this away, guys, is you have to challenge and adapt the design. So what you're doing when you're challenging the design is you're challenging your own idea. So your design. Right? You're going, these people are not enjoying my design. Oh my god, it's wrong. How could I be wrong? You really have to become good at that. Don't become, uh, so it's very, it's very easy to go like, this is my design. They don't understand it. That's what's the problem. They just don't understand. Wrong. If they don't understand, the design is wrong. Okay? Your design is wrong. That's okay. That's totally fine. Don't become so attached. And really, please take this away with you guys. Don't become so attached to an idea, an image, a design, a piece of tech that you don't want to change it. Because you will find it very hard to progress if you do that, OK? Be willing to change and challenge yourself, OK? All right. We're live, right? Yeah? Time to party, right? No, this is the time where you guys, I'm sure nobody here dances like that. But uh, neither do I, by the way. Neither do I. Uh, so yeah, this is the time to party. This is the time where everybody does a little bit of partying, right? But in reality, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not time to party yet, okay? We're nearly there. Now you can party, but only at the weekends, right? We have one more process to go, right? And, and this is the one that is kind of, it's kind of like another approval process, if I'm honest, right? So you've got your soft launch, and soft launch, before you get the hard launch, soft launch is, it's kind of important. Now, 
everybody doesn't do it. Uh, if you're creating your own small game, certainly on, on smaller titles and smaller companies, I've done a few times just not done a soft launch. We've just done a hard launch and it was fine. Uh, but in a company like King, you're not going to be able to, you know, larger companies tend to want to do a soft launch. I'll tell you why. So, does anybody here know what that is? Like a free trial two months before the official launch? Kind of, kind of, nearly there. It's a very eager hand in the back. Kind of, again, you're very close. So you're both, both, cut, can close, okay, yeah? Third one's a charm, come on. Launching the game, but not promoting it with a lot of advertising, so your game is not criticized uh, a lot, and you can see the feedback from people, and after you can do the hard launch, doing it right. That's it. So essentially, it's what you, you guys just said, right? That's basically what it is. So. In a, in a soft launch situation, really what you want to be doing is you, you're going to choose an isolated region, right? A lot of the time we choose places like Canada because it's in North America. And re let's be honest, that's where you want to be selling your game because that's the highest spending region globally, right? Okay. So we, we, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, there's different ports to entry and there's different reasons, right? If you're going to soft launch in a place, sometimes if you're a smaller company, it depends on how much it costs for an install, right? Because you're going to pay for installs. You're not going to get it for free, right? You're going to pay to do your soft launch. You're not going to get anything back from it, okay? Except, like you just said, knowledge, right? So you're going to get back. You, again, you're going to be testing it, but it's a much broader audience, right? So you're really going to be able to test how the game works, if your theories are right. Because even in the last phase that we were talking about, it's a smaller group. This could be thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, potentially, right? So again, you're testing your assumptions. And you're testing the KPIs, which are? No, you're not allowed to say. <laughs> Anybody know what a KPI is? So I want to ask a question. If the sure. soft launch doesn't work, I yeah. mean, people don't like it, and, and they go fast, uh, what do you do with the product? Sure. There's lots of different things that happen in a soft launch, right? So uh, it could be, it kind of depends on what goes wrong, essentially, right? If people don't like it, and it, like if it tanks, like miserably tanks, the likelihood is your game's getting canceled, right? But again, that kind of depends on you. If you're an independent developer, that it's up to you. You kind of look at the surroundings, you go, all right, how much money do I have? Can I do this again? What did I learn? And that's the most important thing. Did I learn enough that I can change the game and then test it again? That's knowledge finance, right? So you're going to have to look at, do I have the finance to test it again? Do I have enough knowledge here that I can change it and make it better, right? So it, it kind of does depend. Um, sometimes you can get really bad feedback, but it's enough that you can actually change it. So it's, it's not that big a deal, right? But it depends, right? So I'm going to go back to KPIs. I feel I'm losing some of you here. So I'm going to give you a lovely other business term, which is, again, boring, right? Uh, it's key performance indicators, right? And they can be I'm going to be honest, they can kind of be anything you want. It's different things that you can put in the game. Uh, it's just, they're just markers to test how your game is working. That's all it is, right? So this is the time where you test those, okay? Again, we're analyzing the data, retention, progression, bookings. These are all the things that you want to test, okay? So now we've got a hard launch, okay? Now we've got a global launch. And now we have a live game, like it is alive, okay? Your game is alive, the beast is there. Now you can party, okay? Now you can party to your heart's content, it's alive. So now we go into the area that I told you about before, right? So the real fun begins here. So I'm gonna, let's go back to where we were before. So again, we talked about ideation, production, and live, yeah? Ideation. We talked about it already, that's the creation part, production, when you're making the thing, and now we're going to live. Now again, I want you to understand, guys, everything we've spoken about already is different to this one. They're not the same, and you can't act the same, right? It's, it's very difficult to act the same, and you might even need different kinds of people on the team. So, live development. Uh, everything you do before you, so there's something else I, I forgot to mention there is, has anybody here heard the term feature creep? Feature creep? No? Does anybody want to take a guess at what feature creep is? Um, 
No, no, you're probably looking at it from a kind of technical point of view, but it's a bit more holistic. Anybody else want to? Like a feature that the audience don't like? No, no, nearly there. So feature creep is the enemy of all producers, right? Feature creep is when you're coming up to release, right, and we're going, oh, let's just put one more thing in the game. But if we put this in, it's going to be great. Oh, we can't release without this. It's not going to be the right kind of game, OK? That's feature creep, right? And that's when you have to be very, very brave. You have to then have a post-launch roadmap, OK? So that's when you have a, a sit down with your, with your team. Imagine we're, you know, we're all a team here, and you guys are shouting at me. You're like, no, we have to get this in the game. This piece of art won't work. This character's got to be in there. That's the time where I have to sit down and go, oh, please don't. Stop, stop, stop. We can't. We can put it in later on, right? The, the reality is you have to define what's in the release, and you have to define what's in the post-launch, right? So everything you do now in live is a post-launch feature, right? So we go into a different way of developing, right? So you'll have your roadmap. You'll have all the, like the, the beginning after you release. You'll have a really set roadmap, because they're all the things that you couldn't manage to get in before you release the game, right? That's where you're going to get that from, basically. So. Again, it's going to have to, you're, going to, you're going to be a different time. It's very business. Now you shift to a more business kind of model, right? Now you have, you're going to have quarterly KPIs, right? So you're going to have every, every quarter your boss is going to be like, eh, make some more money. These are the things you've got to do, or you won't get to the end of the year. And that's the sort of stuff you're going to hear from a, producer's, from a producer's perspective, right? So everything you do has to satisfy the longevity. Because now, before you were creating a game, now you're trying to make the game last as long as you can, right? Because this is a freemium world, right? So in the mobile world, you need to figure out how you're going to make it last longer, 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 longer. Yeah, otherwise, just give up and start another game. Everything you do now is very strongly data-driven, right? Because now you have an audience. Now you have people playing your game. So you've got data coming in, right, from all different angles. So you can test all the different elements of the game, and you have live feedback. Believe me, years ago when I was making games, we didn't have this, right? We used to make games, and it was kind of like making a movie, right? When you make a box tile, you spend millions on it, you spend months on it, you get older looking than you actually are. I'm actually only 15. And you, you basically, you get to the end, and you release it, and you, you cross your fingers. It's like, oh, I hope this is a success. I hope Because you can't do anything afterwards. You release the game, it's out in the wild. It either succeeds or it doesn't. That's it. Not anymore, though. Now we can look at the data, and we can adjust our games. So I would encourage you all, if you're releasing a game, be very cautious of what you're going to do afterwards. Think about, how am I going to, what do I want to know about my game to be able to understand whether I can make it longer or better or faster or stronger, right? The, that's the data. So data will tell you all these things. Um, who here knows what an A-B test is? Nobody? A, B test? A, B, C? Ah, yes, my vigorous man in the back. After birth? After, not an after birth, no. Uh, that's an interesting concept, though. Maybe we should start calling it that. I don't know. Uh, it's not. Anybody else? Want to take a stab at it? Alpha and beta. It's not, but I can, I can understand how you go there. Uh, no, so an A, B test, it's actually it's very, very simply explained, right? When you've got a live game, Often, if you've got something that's kind of disruptive, you don't want to just release it into the wild and to everybody. Because if it like, really breaks your game, like the mechanics or the monetization, oh, you're in trouble. Right? So you don't want to do that. Right? So what you want to do is you want to release it to a small group. Right? So you've got your A, test group, which is just the normal game, essentially. That's your control group. And your B, or it could be A, B, C even. Your B group are the group of people who are going to see this new feature. Right? And the reason we do this, it's just backup. Right? It's really to make sure we don't break the game. What we do is we release it, and we go, OK, here's the groups that we're looking at. If everything in this group is staying flat, and if this one is going monetization, retention, everything's going up, this feature is good, go live, turn it on, right? Send it out to everybody. If it's the other way, and for whatever reason, you see the three core things that I was talking about, retention, right, monetization, if they're going down compared to the normal game, you need to turn this feature off right now. And you need to analyze what was going wrong with it. You'll also have other things within that feature that you'll want to test because they'll be pushing at certain parts of the game. But the main elements of your game, you want to make sure in an A-B test, they don't go down. Right? If they go down, you turn it off, you tweak it, and release it again. So you haven't broken the game, but you've tested a feature. So it's an insurance. Okay? So if you can do that, if you've got a large enough numbers, do it.
Yeah, so. That's absolutely it. Yeah. So essentially, we in the in the department that I work in, um, we basically we're in a very interesting department, right? So we have the ability to understand and spend all of our time running A/B tests. Uh, mostly it's random, mostly it's random, but it is true, sometimes you might want to, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but you might want to do it by region. Um, but really the cohorts are random, so you'll kind of say, okay, you'll shuffle them to a percentage, and also if you have the random and you see that it's going down, and then you want to take it back, tweak it and release it again, you'll reshuffle that, and you'll have another random. But essentially, yeah, you two could be sitting right beside each other and playing different, two ty different types of the game, essentially, right? Uh, and people don't know they're in an A-B test, we don't tell them. Okay, so they just pick up the game one day and there's something new happening in the game and they're like, oh, that's a nice new feature and they either like it or they don't. And that's the data that we get back. So again, it's, it's an insurance. Does anybody have any other questions on A-B tests? Because last time a lot of people had, yeah? Uh, how can you get data from players that don't send you feedback? Ah, okay, so the players are sending feedback the second they open the game. The, every part of our game sends signals back to our servers, right? So that's another thing. Uh, when you have a mobile game, you're going to want to put various things in there that, that test the game, right? So that's the KPIs that we were talking about, right? But inside, anyway, whenever somebody presses anything within a game, it sends off uh, essentially a signal, right? And it sends that to us, right? And so all of these are read by our service, so we know what's going on in any different region, any different time of the day, and how different players are, uh, are playing. That's why you might have heard an awful lot of news around lately about, uh, I think it's GDRP, right? I keep forgetting it the wrong way around. But essentially what it is is uh, privacy. The new, you might be playing apps, and if you notice that a lot of privacy po policies have been changing lately? Yeah? Anybody notice that? Well, that's because a new law came into order, right? And it's not really about us. It's not about games, because we, we look at very simple data. It's only the data how people interact with our games. But there's other products that you have on your phone right now that you will download, and that product, without telling you, will go into your system. It'll look at how you use your phone, how you use your calendar, who your friends are. It'll take loads of data without telling you. That's what that law is about. Um, but it does, it does kind of affect us as well. Because it, like I say, at any given time, any time you touch your game, you're sending us data. Right? You're telling us how you play. So you don't have to actually physically tell us. Uh, you, you're telling us anyway by the way you play. Uh, that's kind of different. So uh, they, I guess it's kind of yeah. So that's kind of more like early releases. They're like, hey, we've got early releases, and we'd like people to play. So that's that's great. That's one thing, right? That could be like uh, we've got something that's so new in our game that we'd like to invite people to play. And generally, if you're in a beta, they're going to ask for your feedback. And and, and you, also the people you get in betas tend to be like hardcore and whatever that thing is. So their feedback, they could be a much smaller group, but it's much more powerful because it's probably a lot more reliable as well. This is not the same thing. This is. You two are playing a game, you're in an A-B test, you're not, right? So you wake up, and you see a normal game, you wake up and you see all of a sudden, oh, I'm in a team and I'm playing against other people and I can receive and say, hey, and you can say to your friend, do, do you have this? No, you don't, because you're not in the A-B test. So we don't tell anybody. But you can manage the, up, the updates in everybody's phone, for example? Uh, yes, but you don't, want to, you don't really want to do that because that's like individual people. If we have the core user ID, so if, someone, if you have a complaint and you contact us, we just say, give me your core URI ID, and then we can do whatever we want to your game. We can change in any way we like, basically. Um, but in general, no, it's just groups. We try to do groups, because individuals, it's, it's quite difficult. But in, to answer your question, yes, any person who contacts us can contact us and say, I want my stuff wiped, or I want you to change the game. We can do that, basically, yeah. Any other questions, A-B tests? Because they're kind of important. You're going to want to do them a lot. No? Cool. Okay, so again, okay, actually we kind of already spoke about this, uh, gross booking and engagement. I'll, I'll jump on because we've kind of gone over that already. So one thing I want to say to you guys is, uh, you, I mean, you guys are already going to know this, right? You, you know enough about games and you play enough games to understand that there has to be a balance. I just wanted to mention it because with all this sort of jargon and the talking that's very sort of businessy, don't forget that you're making games, right? It has to be a really good balance. You have to have fun balanced with 
a business. At the end of the day, if you're, you're making games because you, you're passionate about it, but you want to make a living off of it, right? And that's what we want to do. And to make a living, you've got to make money. But make sure there's that good balance. Because if it's a lovely balance, I, personally, as a, as a player and a payer, I, I will spend in a game, I don't give a damn. You know what I mean? I love it. I get a good experience out of that, and it helps me sort of progress or get cool things in the game. I have no problem doing it because it's fun, right? Get the balance. All right, if, if, and players, they're really smart, they're really clever, people are not dumb. They'll know if you're trying to just get money or you put paywall in or something like that, they're going to know and they're going to react really badly. Okay? okay, ideally, this is the situation you want to be in. Right? You don't have to explain to people why they should pay. Right? The worst thing you want to have is going, oh, well, the reason I want you to go to the shop is because if you buy this and then you... No, you want to be in this situation, right? Where it's like, shut up, take my money. I don't want to know. I just want to play, right? That, that's the kind of player I am, okay? It's in fun games and games that I'm, like, hooked on, yeah? That's, that's what I do, right? And so that, just think of Fry. Always think of Fry. In any situation, really. Okay, cool. So... Let's move on to the project needs. So we've, kind of, we've gone over all the, uh, the, the process and all the various different elements. Does anybody, before we move on to like the needs of a project, do you guys have any questions about what I just went through there, or what we just went through? Anyone? Difference between PBE and ABE test. Beep, say again? PBE. I've never heard of a PBE. <laughs> a, B, so A, B tests and? Okay, so you're talking about different environments. Yeah. Okay, so that's not really to do with the, the test or the A-B test that we'd run. Uh, different environments are basically, if you're talking beta and alpha, they're just different <laughs> stages of the gameplay, right? Okay, so beta and alpha, well, you won't hear them in mobile an awful lot. But what you do hear them in was in console. So console, beta, and alpha are a big thing. So you're in your beta stage and you're in your alpha stage. And actually, if we went back to that uh, slide that I showed you about the, the one in uh, Sims, that has a beta stage in there because EA is such a, a, a console game that even when you're making mobiles, they stick to console ways of working, right? So that's what that is, essentially. You go through your beta tests, and that's like the, are you go, uh, the uh, alpha test. The alpha test is essentially, is the game working at a quality level? Does everything kind of work? It doesn't have to look good. It doesn't matter if someone's arm is kind of twisting in the corner. You need to be able to get on the horse and ride down the hill, right? So that's that bit. The beta is where you're kind of closed almost, right? So you have different parts of beta. This, that you're testing, and then you go into closed beta. Closed beta is where it's like, this better work. You don't want to fail closed beta because you've got to go back again, and it's really painful, okay? So that is much more to do with uh, console because of certifications as well, right? To, do, to release any console game, you have to go through, honestly, the most mind-numbingly boring process of certification. You sit there for hours, and you listen to... Microsoft or PlayStation going, you've got to take this box, and then you go to this page, and you've got to take this box. And, and that, if, you, if you haven't gone through a, uh, alpha and beta testing, then you won't take all the boxes, and you won't get approved by them. They won't approve a game to be released on their console, and it ticks all the boxes that they want. It's something like a percentage rating that you have to have. And if you're under like something crazy like 95%, I haven't done a console game in a few years, but it was quite high then. If you're under a certain percentage, you're not getting released. You've got to go back to the drawing board again. So that's kind of where that, that sits in. So it's a very different thing. It's the process of the game. Questions? Anyone? No? We move on? OK, cool. So project needs. Right, first thing, and again, this is, there's a few key things I really want you guys to remember when you're leaving here. Uh, and this is probably one of the most important, is people. All right? It doesn't matter how good your idea is. If you don't have the right people, and if you don't treat them the right way, your product is crap. It's useless. So it's, there's no point in even trying, okay? An idea is nothing without the people, and a producer is nothing without their team. Their team is everything, okay? So always remember the people. Think about the people that you want to put a man go. If you want to make a game, don't just get your mate on it because it's your friend, right? Think about the people that you need. Think about someone who you know will be able to do the job, right? It's about creating, it's not about creating friends, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to run through very basically all the people who kind of make up what we have, right? It's not the most exciting element, so I'll, I'll go through as quick as I can. But I want to stop on this one at the beginning. Um, and, and I know you will be smiling on the back there. Okay, so we have game designers. And we have various different types of designers, right? Um, 
But one that's kind of quite recent, certainly in you in, in mobile gaming, not so much in console, but in mobile, yes, is UX. Right, so who here is going to tell me what UX design is? I'm sure I'm going to see this. Yes, that's just two words. You didn't explain. Tell me, tell me. I'm all ears. Perfect. That is a very good explanation of what user experience is. You know you can ask a lot of older designers what that is, and they won't be able to tell you, or they'll tell you something wrong, right? Because a lot of people kind of go, I'm a designer, so I'm a UX designer. Easy. Makes sense, right? It's not the same. This is a very, and I can see a designer down there shaking her head, right? Um, it's not the same, right? Now, yes, most designers, if you're going to be a designer, if, and if there are people in this room who are studying design, I implore you, Study user experience as well, because you are really expected to know it, right? All of our designers are badass user experience designers. They're very, very good at it. They understand it because they work with people who are their only job is user experience. So we might make, you might make a design, right? And you're like, okay, this is amazing. I'm a user experience person. I'm going to come along and I'm going to pick holes in that. Why is this? Why is that? Why did it? This doesn't feel good. You know what I mean? And so. That's what you really need to have that user experience base because it'll allow you to question yourself and your own design. And above all else, you need to question your own design, right? So it's great to have a nice flow, but if the experience doesn't feel right, people will drop off, right? So have a base. I would say if you're doing game design or anything at all, look at user experience because every element needs user experience, right? Uh, so developers, obviously, have we got developers in the room? Oh, that was a, that was a bunch of hands, eh? We've got one. OK, brilliant. So client server, what's the difference? Uh, client is the, the user that will use the game, and server is the one that gives the information to the user. Exactly. So the only thing, we won't stay too long on this. Everybody knows what, what, it's very clear cut. Um, but one thing I would say is, obviously, the client and the server speak together all the time. One thing to remember, make sure the real people who are the client and servers do the same. OK? Because believe me, if they don't, oh, world of trouble. World of trouble. Uh, okay, so we have artists, right? So obviously we have game artists. So you've got your character artists, you've got your environment artists, you've got your texture artists, you've got your riggers, you've got your lighters, you've got all of these different people. Artists? Have we got artists in here? Do any of you guys study anything? Or is it just a... <laughs> there's no specific... So we've got an artist here and an artist here, or budding artists, yeah? Okay, cool. So uh, what's the difference between a game artist and a UI artist? Which is? What? Yeah. So, yeah, so continue. I interrupted you, sorry. Uh, the, the UA artists are working with that because uh, they, they need to know uh, how to use to make it uh, so the uh, final user to feel good with it. And the game artists, uh, well, as we maybe you can do more the artists or animators. Or sure. Yeah, that's basically it, right? So the only reason I, I've sort of stopped on this one for a few seconds is because uh, one mistake I made, I started as an artist very many years ago as well, and one of the mistakes I made was I thought, UI, easy. If I can make a character, I can do some UI. Very, very wrong. Uh, it's really difficult. So if you're going to do UI, you, you would, I would actually recommend you go down the road of a UI artist. It's very specific. It's very difficult for us to find UI artists. It's very hard to do. To make a very clear, concise, and understanding area with loads of information that has to work all the time, that's not easy. So I would actually encourage, if any of you are there and you think, well, UI, it's just, it's very niche market, and it's going to get bigger. It's hard for us to find those people. So it's, it's, it's a real thing. So OK, QA, obviously, everybody know what QA analysts are. We have leads that we call agile test leads. We can talk about that later. OK, so BPU. More interesting business stuff. What's BPU? No? Do you want to take a stab? Even a guess. Come on. I know, I know you got something down there. After birth. Come on. <laughs> no? That's fair enough. To be honest, it, 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 to be honest, until you enter games, there's probably until you actually enter making games in a company, there's no need for you to use these guys, right? So it's the sorry? 
One out of three. Who wants to go for the second or the third? Business? No, because that's PU. <laughs> Performance <laughs> unit. So <laughs> almost, almost there. <laughs> Lots of P's. So it, it basically, the, it's, the, it's the business performance unit. Now, what these people are made up of are business performance managers. Yeah. So these are the, the managers. Uh, uh, basically, what they do, I won't bore you too much because I'm sure nobody here is studying that. Um, what it is essentially is they're, they're testing. If you imagine your game is a mini business, they're telling you how healthy it is. That's it. Right? So they're the people who are basically going, okay, you know, they, they work very closely with producers. We work very, very closely with them because we need to understand how healthy our game is. So when we're looking at features, they will absolutely change our mind as to what features will go in the game. Because if it's not high performing as a producer, I probably don't want it in my game. It needs to perform, you know? And these are really, really vital people to tell you and advise you. They're like, they're basically business partners, okay? Then they also have data scientists, okay? And believe me, it is science what they do, or dark magic, I don't know which. We keep them locked in the basement, we don't talk to them very much. Um, so that's not true, by the way, they're on the roof. Uh, and then, of course, we have producers, so we're there as well, right? We, we're kind of useful sometimes. Okay, so moving on from that, let's, let's look at ways of working, all right? And I saw you working like this earlier, so uh, eyes front. Um, basically, uh, there's lots of different ways of working, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out a few ways of working, and then I want you guys to tell me what they are, right? And I'm sure a few of you have heard of a few of them, right? Okay, so we've got, what, what, what are you going to do? You're going to go Scrum, Agile, right? You're going to go Waterfall, a bit old school, uh, Kanban, no? Anybody know what these are? You're going to go top down, or you're going to go flat structure? Now, does anybody here know what any of these things are? Scrum. Okay, I thought you might. Explain to me, what is Scrum? A to-do list. That is a cheap way of getting out of an explanation. <laughs> what? What? So, no, it, I mean, it's kind of, kind of, to-do list. There are the things to do, uh, the things that are doing, and that we are currently doing, mm -hmm. the done things, and that's it, more or less. So that, that's, that, the way you just described it is, what you described is a scrum board, right? Mm -hmm. So everybody knows what a scrum board is, I guess. Well, a lot of people do. So a scrum, that's what a scrum board. So a scrum board is literally, it's a physical way of saying to do, doing, in QA, in progress, whatever. And you can see how, you can literally look at your scrum board and go, oh, I know how my, my sprint is going. Does anybody know what a sprint is? And I'm not talking about racing, kind of, but anybody? Anybody? No? So a sprint is just a portion of time that you go, you, as you say, right, it's, it's, uh, it's things where they are in progress, but really Scrum is a framework. It's just a framework to go, this is a huge amount of work. How can we break it down into small bite-sized stories is just one of the things that we use, right? And your stories are the things you see on the Scrum board, right? They're the, the tasks that go across the board, okay? So Scrum, that's what Scrum is. It's just a, it's a way of working, but what it really is as well, it's, a very, um, it's very good for the team because uh, I'll, I'll go into that in a second, but Agile. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Agile is very similar to Scrum, if I'm honest. It's, it's just a methodology, and it's about a way of working that you don't stick too rigidly to anything, and you're free to move things around and try different things. So it's very, very good. It's very useful. But again, there's a lot of stuff in it that's just not really very good. Um, you just use the best stuff out of it, if, if I'm honest. Uh, waterfall? Nobody knows what waterfall is? OK. So waterfall, if I'm honest, is, it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit of an older school way of working, right? It's like, we don't use it. But again, it could be useful for a certain project. All it means is, you can't do this until you do this, right? And you can't do this until you do this. So it kind of goes in a waterfall method, right? If you look at it on a project plan, it goes that, 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 that. It's very linear, OK? Uh, it doesn't for, allow for a lot of change or anything like that. So that's another one. And then Kanban. Kanban is very similar to Scrum and Agile. Kanban would be really useful for you guys, actually, if you're doing a project. It's actually a really good way of working. So if you have a bunch of tasks, you don't go and go, oh, well, we'll do this first and we'll do that. You just literally go like, all right, they change in order of importance on any given day. And that just shifts to the top, and that's the next one that gets done and moved across the board. That's basically it. I mean, people will say it's a lot more complicated. That's just because they're trying to sell you a book. Uh, the other one is, so top-down and flat structure are two things we're going to talk about. So, 
essentially, these are the ways we work. Most mobile game companies now, maybe when you guys uh, you know, are, are out in the wild, it, it might be a little different. But this is a very modern way of working. This is the way most companies work, even the smaller companies. The reason being is Scrum and Agile kind of go hand in hand. And they are very much, what it is, it stops the kind of top down. And it allows you to have a bit more of a flat structure. So what a flat structure means is that you don't have me as the boss, you as the second boss, him as the third boss, and we're all talking down to the other people. That, does, that doesn't really work. And you shouldn't work like that. It's a really, you know, it's a very old way of working. Um, you need to empower your teams. Your teams are the ones, I keep saying, they're the people who are going to get it done. I, as a producer, am about the what. This is what I think we should have in the game. This is what the business needs are. This is where I think we should go. You, as the team, are the how. Okay. So I would come and say, this is what we need to do. Can you tell me how to do it? And that's where Scrum and Agile comes into play. Because you come back to me and you go, OK, these are all the different things that we're going to have to do to do this crazy feature that you want. And you say it's this much time, but we've sized every single thing, and it doesn't fit. right? So it's always, it's always a, a, an, an argument forward and back. right? But in reality, it's, if it doesn't fit, you either take something out or you put more time on it. Right? If you do it any other way, what happens is you go into crunch. And everybody knows what crunch is, right? It's hell, exactly. That's a man who's been in crunch. So uh, crunch is a horrible time where you're basically working till four in the morning every day, and you're working weekends, and you're doing that for about six months. So it's, 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 it's not very nice. But luckily, it's kind of leaving the games industry. And I'm hoping that none of you folks will ever have to do crunch, um, yeah, unless you want to do it yourself and you're trying to meet a deadline. These kind of, if you stick to these methodologies, it's a lot easier to not do crunch because the team are saying, this is what we can do. This is how we're able to do it. Right? It's always capacity versus scope. Right? What is the scope of the thing you want to do and what is the capacity of the team to do it? It's always that, never anything else. And anybody who says otherwise, again, is probably lying to you and you'll end up doing crunch. Right? So always think capacity versus scope. It's, it's always a negotiation. There's always time and there's always things that can be taken out. Okay? But yeah, so that's, that's kind of how we work. Uh, so within the different stages, you're going to want to kind of have different groups of people as I keep banging on about, right? So this isn't, this isn't exactly it, but you, you know, at the, at the ideation phase, this is kind of it. Who here is currently working on a project of their own? Whoa, slow down. OK, maybe that comes later on. Um, so when you will, uh, like later on, in, uh, certainly through university, you will be working on a project of your own. And when you do a small little project, certainly at the ideation phase, you probably don't t need much more of a team than this, right? Small, agile teams, OK? That's all you need. You need just you know, strong producer in there. You need a strong designer, UI or game artist, depending. You need, if you're lucky, you'll have a QA analyst. But mostly, it's probably just you testing your own stuff yourself. You've got your developers, and you've got your back-end developer as well tend to have more client than backend, right? Or more client than server, right? Um, you'll hear backend and server, they're both the same thing. Client and front end, same thing, right? So yeah, in the ideation phase, yeah, kind of more or less like that, right? So when you hit the production, it gets bigger, right? Production live is always bigger. Now again, this isn't the exact, but it's generally like that, right? You're going to have much bigger. You're going to see different people come in here. Scrum master, who here knows what a scrum master is? So, say again, who was who? The person who organizes the scrum kind of says it on the box, doesn't it? Exactly, yeah. So they're actually a little bit more than that, though. They tend to be uh, partners with producers. They really make everybody's life much better. And they kind of organize the day-to-day, -day, how we interact. And often, in many places, the producer is the, is the what, and like I said, the team is the how. The scrum master will facilitate the team, and they'll help the team go, hey, like, break it down, and they'll keep the team you know, focused essentially, a lot of the time. And then they're very, people per they're very much people persons as well. They manage people a lot. Uh, yeah, you've got your BPMs, your data scientists, and you've got more d uh, designers. You've got your ATL uh, and your UX designers. So it gets bigger, right? So at this stage, you, you, you basically, the, what I'm trying to get through to you is know, know what size you need of the team for the different parts of the, the project. So these are kind of like smallish teams, right? You've got two teams here. Uh, these ones are, are, this is a really good way of working. I know because. These are my teams. Um, 
So these are some of the teams I work with. Uh, and so just to give you an idea of like a small game that's still very, very healthy and a very strong game, you don't need that many people in mobile. Like literally, these are two games that are, are quite successful, right? Um, you've got your shared people in the middle. So these are the people that can kind of jump around. And then you've got your core basic teams. It's not exactly the size. We've got a few more and a few less on, on either side. But that's kind of like what you need is in a small team, right? So as you can see, it's not very much. And you can, you can run a really strong title off of that. Um, medium team gets bigger. You kind of start to see senior producers coming to the play. So you might have a producer where you have, OK, different producers are reporting in. And then they've got their own little teams inside that team. So they're often called pods. The pods are working on different parts of the game at the same time. OK? So you stagger your releases and you do various things like that. That's kind of the gist of a medium-sized team. Does that make sense to everybody? And your large franchise teams, franchise is what we call our candies, right? These are the big ones. It's just kind of infinitely bigger, right? But one of the things that you'll see pop up here is an executive producer. The executive producer tends to pop in in the bigger, business savvy, very important to the company games, right? Uh, your executive producer is very much the business mind. They're the business person talking about the, to the rest of the game, right? Uh, so yeah, as you can see, these are really big. I mean, you can literally have like a few hundred people. Uh, I mean, I don't know how many we've got on, on Candy. It's, it's quite a few. It's over 100 people on a mobile game. Right? So, OK. It's kind of warm in here. I can see a few of you nodding off. So we can get to the conclusion, and then you can, you can tear me apart with your questions. OK? Uh, so what have we learned here? OK, so a few things just for you guys to take away, right? My man in the corner is definitely out. Um, <laughs> so uh, new creation is very different to live, OK? Just remember that. Remember the two differences, right? Your new creation, you have to do certain things that you don't have to do in live. You're live. You're very much business that you're not, you're going to do stuff that you're not going to do in your, in your new creation, OK? They're very different. And remember the difference, OK? Uh, really. You need to understand your product. And, and it's very, very important that you understand your product. Because if you don't understand your product, you will have no clue about your needs. All right? So just think of these basic things. Know the product. Know the needs. You're setting yourself up for success. All right? At different stages, like I mentioned, it'll change. The needs will change. Right? The other thing is remember the vision. Don't forget the vision. If you forget the vision, you'll lose the team. Right? Think of the vision like this, honestly. Right? You've got your team, and you're at the front of the team, and you're in the woods, and it's night, right? You've got the torch, right? So everyone's following you because you can see the track. As soon as you lose that torch, all of a sudden, people are going off the track, right? And people will go on their own track because they now have their own vision, right? But you've lost it. You've lost the team vision. The likelihood of you getting to the end successfully has diminished drastically, okay? So just remember what you're trying to do. Always ask yourself, does this fit in the vision of the game? Does this work? Or is it just weird, right? Uh, this will, as I just mentioned, this will keep your, your project on track. So always, always remember the vision for the project. So there are the things we've learned. So I'm going to give you a few rules to live by. Now, these are just things that I believe, all right? Everybody, you can, might have somebody else standing up here next week that says, I'm an idiot, and they've got a whole other bunch of rules. That might resonate better with you. That's fine. Listen to as many people as you can and make your own choices, OK? One thing I would say, though, is that these, as you accrue uh, knowledge and you've gone through various things, you'll pick up little, little things that, that will guide you on the way you want to, to work within games. And you can work the way you want to work in games, OK? So some of the things that I always think of is, and this is really important, right? You guys, right? Let's say you make a game tomorrow. Yeah? You're like, ah, oh, I own this. is brilliant. My game. No. You are not the product owner. And I, you might remember me earlier saying that producers are often called product owners. That's wrong. We are not the product owner. The product owner, does anybody want to take a guess? Who might be the product owner? Good guess. No. Testers, no. The company, again, no. From a business point of view, they'll argue yes. But the product owner, the user, exactly. I heard the player over here as well. Exactly. Remember, the product owner is the person who takes your product and pays for it. Okay. As soon as somebody starts paying, they are now the product owner. They own the game. All right. Okay. 
they have, they've invested and they want to invest time in your game. And if you want them to invest time in your game, treat them like they're the product owner. Treat them good, okay? Listen to what they have to say and make the game that they want. Because if you make the game that you want, chances are hundreds of thousands of other people who you're trying to sell don't care, all right? Make your game with passion, but make the game for the people, all right? Make it for the players and listen to what they have to say. So going on to the players, Know your players, right? Know who you're making your game for. One of the easiest mistakes at the very beginning is just making a game for anyone, okay? Even if you're saying it's a certain genre of game, know those players, understand. It goes right back to the beginning where you're analyzing the market and you're understanding the competition. Know the players at the very beginning. Who do you want to be your demographic? Who's gonna buy your game? And then you can tailor your idea or your product around those players, okay? Very, very important. The other thing is, and this is the, this is the bit that I, that a lot of people don't agree with me on this. I, I must, mu I really want you to take this away. The people are more important than the product. The team that you work with is more impo important than the product that you're working on. Because if you put the product above the people and you lose the people, you have no product. If you lose the product, you still have awesome people, okay? I often get told, oh, it must be really cool. You work in games. You make games. That's awesome. And I always say the same thing. I don't make games. I just work with amazing people who make games. And I'm very privileged to do so. Always remember, the people will make your product better. Create an environment where your team can succeed. Create an environment where they're going to create awesome stuff. If you do that, I guarantee you, I guarantee your product is going to be better. I guarantee it, without a doubt. And the most important thing is, I'm going to leave you with this, just have fun, right? These are a bunch of the Egypts and the great people that we work with. I don't know, you're probably in here somewhere. Um, and so these are, these are like two of our bosses, for example, okay? When we joined the studio, there was like a marriage of the studio, okay? Honestly, that's, I, one of my bosses is there, right? This, this is, we have an enormous amount of fun. Have fun, you're making games. If you're too serious about it, you won't be able to come up with fun ideas, all right? So it's challenging, it's hard. There's a lot of hard work in it. But if you remember a few key things and then you try to have fun along the way, you'll release cool products. Having fun will allow you to release fun games, okay? And that is pretty much it. Uh, you're all free now, my man. You can have a little nap there, no worries. <laughs> it's warm in here, I know. Uh, so that's it, thank you very much, guys. Thank